If I go lower, then I have to start the timer all over again. And then you have chicken that's cooked beyond oblivion and it's not tasty. Good morning, beautiful people. Today's video is a little bit different today. While Ben was out doing the grading work on the barn the other day, I was actually in here filming a video for how to pressure can the chicken. And when I was editing, I realized that it was like way longer of a segment than it was gonna fit in the grading video. So I decided to split it into two videos. I'm making the pressure canning video a standalone. It goes into detail of how I do it. A lot of people have asked for this, so I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna make a whole video on this. It'll be standalone so you can find it easily. So that's what today's video is, and I'm just gonna jump right into it here. All right. So, we've got our chicken picked between me and all four boys. We got it done in half an hour, which is kind of cool. So this is what we picked today, plus the little bit from the stuff we picked earlier last week. I also have my stock that I made last week strained, cooled, pulled off the skim to the fat off, and it's ready to go, so I'm heating that up and getting it ready. I'm gonna wash some jars real quick and get all my equipment and everything ready to go. And then I am gonna go over with you how I can the chicken. Lots of people have asked for me to explain how we pressure can it and get it ready to put away for the winter so we can eat our fast food meals later. y'all quick and dirty pressure canning 101 I'm gonna try to make this as like brief and hopefully easy to understand as possible because I think it is a process that if you were to you could get really really twisted off into making it way more complicated than it actually needs to be I will admit before I started pressure canning on my own I was very nervous about it but after I did it the first time I realized that there's really nothing to be nervous about it's not hard it's not scary it's not even anything more than water bathing really as far as the process and the steps go you just have to be careful about the steps and you have to take the right steps let's go over the equipment real quick pressure canner which is different than a pressure cooker this is a pressure canner it's specifically designed for canning then i have my jars which i have washed and I've also checked, as I wash, I just check to make sure there's no like chips or cracks, um, cracks in the side of the jar or chips in the rims because if you have chips and cracks, then you risk a seal fail or like it could break. I have a funnel to make it easier to put things in the jars. I have my jar lifter, which is mostly for when I'm getting them out of the canner because they'll be hot. I have a headspace measure. This is one Ben made, but you can get ones anywhere. Um, I also have a magnet, which is going to help me get my lids out of the hot boiling water. My lids are in a pot of water that I'm going to be bringing up to a simmer. Technically, I believe they removed that requirement for simmering your lids ahead of time. I think you can just put them on cold now, but I like to keep them at a simmer because I feel like it softens the compound a bit more so I get a better seal. I don't know if there's any science to that, that's just my personal feelings and I'm going with it. If you are processing, whether it's water bath or pressure canning, for longer than 10 minutes, you don't need to pre-sterilize your jars. Some people still do and that's fine, I mean, have at it. You can do that in boiling water, like if you had a water bath canner going, you could put your jars in that and simmer them. You can run them in a sterilization cycle on your dishwasher, but I'm cool with them sterilizing themselves in the pressure canning environment or the water bath canning environment to the point where there are times where even if like a batch of jelly in a water bath canner says only 10 minutes, I just add like five more minutes so I don't have to worry about <laughs> sterilizing them ahead of time because I don't have a dishwasher and it like just it's easier this way. The difference is between pressure canning and water bath canning. Water bath canning is for foods, items, recipes, whatever, that are acidic. So that's most every fruit, tomatoes, and then anything with a decent amount of vinegar in it that's been formulated to get the acidity high enough. You have to pressure can anything that is low acid food. So that's basically everything that's not fruits, tomatoes, or like pickled foods or things with vinegar in it. So meats, broth, most vegetables, stews, that kind of thing, beans, all that kind of stuff. Because pressure canning gets up to a higher temperature where water boiling is only 212, pressure canning gets it up to about 240. And that makes sure that anything that might be in there that could, you know, go off is killed in that high 
high heat environment. And that's simmering away, so we could pretty much just get started now. All right, I have my cooked, picked meat right here. Because this is already cooked, basically the liquid has already come out of this meat, so I'm going to be filling my jars with the meat and this broth. You could also just use hot water, a vegetable broth, like anything, like just a liquid of some sort that is gonna go to cover these in the jars. If I had raw meat, like I was cutting up chunks of chicken breast, I would be putting these into the jar raw and I would not be adding any liquid because the juice and the liquid that comes off of the raw meat is going to be enough to fill these jars. So adding more liquid on top of that would actually cause them to like bubble out and fail your seal. So we are gonna put our cooked meat. This is called a raw pack method. You could do a hot pack where you brought everything up to simmer, like in there with your broth, and then you would put it in. But I'm doing the raw pack. I prefer it, it's easier, it's less time consuming. So we're putting all of the chicken into a jar and we're gonna leave one inch headspace. And I'll explain that in a sec when we get there. And I'm not like, firmly packing this in, but I'm getting it in there where it's like not super loose. Because if I can get as much chicken in there as I can, then that's good. It means I need less broth. But I also don't want it so packed in that when it heats and expands, it's going to like burst out of the jar. Now, I know from experience that this, I'll do it on this jar, this ring right here is one inch from the top. So, I'm packing it up to that ring with a little bit less. I'm giving it some more extra room because when we put our broth in here, that's gonna fill it up all the way. So I'm leaving it a little less than that one inch. The reason for your head space is to allow enough space for expansion of your foods in whatever method is currently being used for processing. If you don't give it enough space, then it will expand too far and everything's gonna leak out of your lids and then you're gonna get food under your lid and on your rim and that could cause a seal failure. You also lose a bunch of stuff in your jars and that's kind of a bummer too. Every recipe, every food has a different headspace for it. For the most part, jams and jellies are a quarter inch, salsas and like chunkier things are like half inch and then your meats almost across the board are one inch. Always check your recipe, but generally speaking, that's what it is. And that's just to allow for the expansion with the heat and the simmering and the boiling that the juice is gonna do inside the jars while still giving it enough space to not boil out. You also want to have enough airspace in there to when the process is done and the oxygen escapes, the lid seals down like it's supposed to. Alrighty, now that I've got all my jars packed with the chicken, I'm going to ladle in my hot broth into the jars up to that one inch headspace line. With chicken and a lot of other meats, if you're packing them like this, um, you'll notice a lot of air bubbles. So I'm gonna get this up to where it should be and then you can either stick in a plastic tool of some sort and then along the sides, just stick your plastic tool in. Also, sometimes what I will do is on a padded surface, like a towel, just kind of tap it and that taps a lot of the bubbles out as well. And then I see that it's dropped in level a little bit as the air bubbles have come up. So I'm just going to top it off to that one inch space and we're good to go on that one. Ooh, that's hot. Everything's filled with my stock and everything. Now I'm gonna wipe the rims and for meat and broth and things that are fatty, I use vinegar on my cleaning cloth because it cuts the grease. So, uh, this apple cider vinegar, you could use white vinegar, you could probably even use like red wine vinegar if you needed to. Just something acidic that will cut the grease. And we're cleaning off the rims so that we don't have anything in the way of our seals. Fold over and go to a new part every jar or two to make sure nothing's like wiping back onto the rims. Now we're gonna put our lids on. Okay. Well, my magnet keeps falling out of my picker upper, so. Oh, those are hot. It's right here. 
You gonna fix it for me? Oops. This one's too. Ooh, ah, be careful. Uh, Alright, and then the rings on. They say fingertip tight, meaning don't like fork it down, but gently. But enough to where it's actually gonna like hold the lid on. Alright, now they're gonna go into the pressure canner. In my pressure canner, I have about three quarts of water. It's up to a line that's demarked on there. For your pressure canner, it might be a different amount, but for mine, it's got the line. So I just fill it up to there. And I've got it started on some heat, so it's going to be, it's not simmering, but it's warm. The biggest thing with canning, and this is why you will hear them say like, oh, make sure it's hot when you jar it and make sure your water's hot, is you basic, the reason for that is you don't want serious temperature changes with glass jars. So if you're putting cold food into a hot water bath or a hot pressure canner bath, it's gonna explode. And the same with if you're putting hot jars into cold water, it's gonna explode, or it's potentially going to explode. So we're putting hot jars into mostly hot water. Um, there's also a, like a trivet type thing, a rack on the inside. Hopefully you can see it. Um, to prevent the jars from sitting straight on the bottom because that would be too much heat and that it could also crack them So you want some kind of rack in there to make sure that they're not touching the bottom jars are in now I'm putting the lid on this has a gasket in it and so you line up the arrows twist it and that gasket um, Compresses so that you're getting a seal now I'm gonna turn the heat up so that this starts to simmer on the inside and then what we're looking for is steam to come out of this vent. Eventually, once the steam has come out and it's vented for 10 minutes, we're gonna put this rocker on it to seal it. But we want steam to come out of that for 10 minutes and what that does is that's getting all the extra air out of there to make room for the steam so that it can do its heating that it needs to do. While we're waiting for the steam to come out, I wanted to show you two of the books that I reference most often. Um, when I first started canning, I had, and I still have, the big uh, ball book of home preserving or the complete home preserving from Ball. It's, it's also a Ball book. But recently, I've just been referencing these ones, which is the Ball Blue Book Guide to Preserving, and um, I ordered the USDA Complete Guide to Home Canning, which you can find both of these on Amazon, I'll drop some links below for you guys. I just have been referencing these instead of my other one just because it seems to be like quicker and easier for me to pull this out and get to what I need to get to. I will also drop a link below for my pressure canner, hopefully, as long as, long as they still have this model. It's a Presto and I love it. It's been great, it's super easy to use. I haven't had any issues with it ever. Um, I've even made sure I've ordered like extra seals and some valves and stuff so when those deteriorate, which they will over time because they're just rubber, um, I can just like pop the new ones in and keep going. <laughs> what are you doing, silly girl? Here. Here, thank you. Oh, I'm trying to get to where we can see this. All right, so this is an example of what the steam, like proper steam venting out of that vent is. Focus. Um, it's consistent. It's one long stream. And we're gonna let this go for 10 minutes. I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes and then we will put the weight onto that. that's on there I'm turning this down for me it's like a two one to two and we're gonna let this come to pressure for our altitude it's 11 pounds of pressure and then once it's at pressure that's when we start the timer and for meat most all meat it's about 90 minutes per course if I'm doing just broth and it's 30 minutes if I was doing a canner load that had broth and meat in it it would be 90 minutes because you always go for the item that needs the most time. Letting this come to pressure. I'll adjust this as needed, up or down, just a smidge, just to keep that pressure around 11 pounds. I don't wanna go lower than that. If I go lower, then I have to start the timer all over again, and then you have chicken that's cooked beyond oblivion and it's not tasty. So, I, I watch it pretty closely, and I keep it at that 11 pounds, or maybe a little bit higher. And then I set the timer for 90 minutes, and we do a countdown and just wait. All right, our 90 minutes is up, we turned it off. Now we're gonna wait for this to depressurize and I'm not gonna go off the dial gauge for that, I'm gonna go off of this pressure release valve. So this will say zero, but it'll still take a little bit until this pops down. 
once that's down, I know it's depressurized and then I can move on with the process of getting the jars out. It takes a little bit because you have to make sure everything cools and comes like naturalizes with the the room temperature air so you're not going to like pull jars out and have them pop. But we're waiting for this to depressurize and then we will move on. Okay, the pressure valve is down. Take her off. Carefully, and I wear gloves for this because it is hot. Take this off, open it away from you. And then we're gonna let these sit for at least 10 minutes so that they can kind of normalize with the room temperature and they aren't gonna siphon out, which means like the contents go spewing out because of the temperature change. All right, these have cooled. They are, I mean not cooled, but you know, like normalized to room temperature and I'm going to ever so carefully pull these out. You can see they're bubbling, that's totally normal. And then I'm gonna set them on a towel. On a, basically on a surface that's not going to transfer any kind of weird cooling or anything like that. And they're gonna sit here and cool on the counter for 24 hours and then I'm gonna remove the bands, give them a good wash um, so that it gets rid of all the grease and then put them in the pantry. I wash them for, I mean, two reasons. One, to get rid of the grease because it's just like slimy and gross because stuff does kind of come out when you're canning. And then also, if you have a clean jar that you're putting into your pantry, then if something goes awry for whatever reason, like if your seal fails and it starts like oozing gross stuff, then you're gonna know from the outside that something went wrong and you have a bad jar. If you stick it, it in the pantry dirty already, then you're not gonna be entirely positive if that was from canning or if that's from stuff like oozing out of the jar because it went bad. I'll get those cooled washed, put away, and we'll use these for fast food in the future, for chicken salad or chicken soup or chicken pot pie or whatever. Like, name a dish that needs cooked chicken in it and we'll use it for that. And that is it. Pressure canning, quick and dirty, 101. I hope you guys learned something new. I hope it took away the fear. Like, it's really simple. It's not a big, scary thing. It's worth it to put food in the, in the pantry and have quick meals on hand. That's it for the day. I'm done. I'm gonna clean up and then we're gonna go to bed or something. We'll catch you guys on the next one.